Rosella is a senior technical staff member at IBM. She's currently one of the leading architects responsible for IBM Cloud Platform. And today, Rosella will be talking about blockchain applications. Are they real? Uh, so she will show us blockchain applications in enterprise scenarios, including some real use cases where this technology is applied. So please welcome Rosella. Dziękuję wszystkim. Uh, the presentation will be in English anyway. So what I'm going to tell you about, uh, I started doing this presentation because there has been a lot of adoption of blockchain technology that looked as a kind of panacea, as we're going to fix everything. So people will start throwing blockchain everywhere and surprise was a failure because not all scenarios are suitable for blockchain. So my main goal today is Introducing a set of boring terminologies <coughs> first, talking about different types of blockchains, we are going to focus only on one. Then the key part is identifying which are the good use cases to adopt a blockchain. And then I really would like to take you some real implementation, successful implementation of blockchain. Are you familiar with blockchain? Yeah, that's okay. So let's start with the boring part. So business, how do we business nowadays, 2019? We cannot do business in isolation. Why is that? If I'm producing something and I'm consuming it, there is no business. Even if I'm doing simple things like growing apples, I want to sell apples to somebody, I have at least one person to do business with. But typically, I will have more than one apple tree, more than one buyer. Most likely, I want to store my apples in a warehouse. I want to sell them to a food industry that maybe is going to slice them and put them in a nice packaging. There will be a retailer is going to send. Oh, nice. I used to do this presentation without slides. There is a common standard problem. So, <laughs> so the, the thing is that at the end, we don't talk about just single individual, but we always talk about the business network. And it's not just the consumer, the grower of the apples, and the whole chain with the retailer, the warehouse, the wholesalers, and so on. But there will be other interesting guys like government for taxes, insurance companies, banks for mortgages, and things like that. So it's a, a really complex ecosystem, a lot of people involved. The other thing is that typically, even for the simple scenarios like Apple, that with, um, with which I'm going to torture you through the, throughout the whole presentation, you don't business just in e your country anymore. Or typic typically, what's going to happen, you're hitting an Apple, and the Apple maybe is coming from Italy, or it's coming from China, or it's coming some, from somewhere else. If you think about that, that is adding a little bit more complexity, because Every time you cross a border, there are some certification to be honored, some laws to be honored, some taxes to be paid. The more, the smoothest we can make this process and the faster we can make the goods going around my apples, the more money I do, the more wealth I produce. And I think, I mean, this is kind of obvious. And then, of course, we can have public markets, like the Apple one, I go to a supermarket and I don't need to show my ID card to buy apples. Or they could be private markets, like the financial market or supply chains, right? And so far, I think, okay, yeah, that's kind of boring, but it's nothing to do with blockchain. We'll see that. Two main kinds of blockchains, two main types. Everybody is adopting blockchain typically because it provides an irrefutable proof of a set of transactions. So what I want to do with blockchain is storing the key information that I sold the Apple to him. That's it. Once the information is stored into the blockchain, it's immutable. This is what we are looking for. And I know I'm doing a trivial example. Of course, pay attention, this is not a proof of truth. It's a proof of the transaction. So I can agree with the person with whom I've done business and cheat and put the bad information inside blockchain. So we're cheating, but <coughs> the thing is stored forever into the blockchain. Then we will see some interesting implications. Just keep this thought in mind. Two big types of blockchain, public blockchains. I think everybody is familiar with the story of bitcoins, right? What they do? Cryptocurrencies. Key characteristic, anonymity. It's the, exactly the same story as with banknotes. Do you have your name on the banknotes you have in your wallet? I don't think so. If you lose them, one finds them, there is no name, it's going to be his or hers, right? 
no magic. And because of anonymity, I need the wiseness of the whole network joining the Bitcoin network to mine the Bitcoins. That's the way to validate proof of work, consuming a lot of energy, right? I'm not going to talk about this one, sorry. If you were expecting a talk on Bitcoin, no. I'm going to talk about private blockchains, the ones that are used by enterprises. Key characteristics, uh, running, I mean, my favorite framework, because that's the one we use in IBM Cloud. It's an open source to which IBM is contributing to. It's the main contributor, it's Hyperledger Fabric. Uh, key things, it deals with assets. I'm going to spend some more boring time on defining assets that can be goods, like the apples, that are going to be the key thing we are tracking transaction for in the blockchain. The other thing is that I care about identity. Can you imagine doing a bank transaction, for example, without knowing with whom you're exchanging money? Is that possible? No, it doesn't work. So you can see the key difference. Anonymity versus identity. We'll spend a couple more minutes on that. And the other thing is endorsement. I don't need a proof of work. I know exactly who's taking part in the transaction. If I'm buying a house, it's myself, the one who's selling me the house. Typically, there is a bank because I'm getting a mortgage and there is a notary. If we are for, for agree on the rules, I can buy house and I have endorsement. These are the key differences between the two types of blockchains. And I'm really going to focus on the second scenario because that's the one enterprises are dealing with. Assets. What's an asset? Asset, it can be a material or immaterial good. It can be something like the Apple I'm trading, or it can be a patent. The participant to the business and network will agree on which kind of assets they want to deal with. The change in state of the asset is tra traced through transactions. And it's pretty intuitive. I know I'm telling you some obvious stuff. Like, the apple is mine, I sell it to somebody else, it's changing the status, the owner is changing, right? And how do I do the transaction? Through smart contract, or you will see in the blockchain terminology, chain code. Uh, what is a smart contract? It's a way of writing into code all the steps that define the purchase of an apple. Simple scenario, how do we close a contract in buying an apple? The producer gives me the apple, I receive the apple, maybe I check the quality, I give him money, and he gives me a receipt. When all these conditions are met, this is my smart contract, signed, transaction, stored in the blockchain, from that on, immutable. And then the other aspect, identity. As I said, I mean, we cannot do business with somebody we don't know. Uh, Besides the obvious consideration, there are, of course, legal, security, and compliance consideration. There are protocols that need to be honored, like know your customer, or anti-money laundry, or fighting the terrorism. I really need to know exactly with whom I'm doing business. Why is this so important? Because at that point, first of all, I'm compliant with, with, compliant with all the, the rules, but then I don't spend energy and waste energy in mining to get consensus and sign and close my transactions. Because as for the example of the house, I know exactly the others, uh, the, the guys, the members that have to join to agree on a transaction. Uh, the key thing is that since identity is key, uh, what we can do is, uh, yeah, I can agree with, with somebody that he gave me the famous Apple and we put a fake transaction in blockchain, but since identity is important, an auditor, legal, or whatever other entity was going to inspect the transaction knows exactly who participated to the transaction. So you can cheat, but at the end of the chain, you will know who's done it. A uh, key thing is also identity is crucial for security. Uh, everything is accessed typically through private and public certificates that authorize, authorize and authenticate members. Uh, transactions, we talked about that. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that because I think it can be an obvious concept now. Um, characteristic of a good blockchain use case. Let's start digging into that. 
Definitely we need a business network, right? Like in the Apple scenario, if it's just myself, it's not worth investing in a blockchain. The other scenario, it's pretty interesting. Actually, the next two will go hand in hand, siloed repositories and multiple writers. Uh, another name by which you may have heard about blockchain, it's a shared ledger, right? A ledger is not something new. It's been created by an Italian monk, I think it was 1494, something like that. Uh, what is happening? I'm selling my Apple. I have my ledger where I'm saying, Rossella sell, sold the Apple for this amount of money to somebody, right? The guy on the other side is taking the same ledger and is taking note, like, I bought an Apple from Rossella for this amount of money on day X, Y, Z, right? What can happen? These two ledgers are completely separate entities. I can mistakenly, mistakenly write something wrong and we start getting into panic mode because there is no single source of truth. So if on my ledger I say that I sold the Apple for two euros and on the other ledger, on the other side of the guy, the guy say, I bought the, euro for, the, the apple for one euro, who's right? We don't know. We fight. And in real enterprises, this, this can take months and lawyers and money involved and wasted into these disputes. So when you get into these two kind of situations, oh, there is a good sign that you need a blockchain. Uh, minimal trust. Why is that minimal trust? Because you don't have a single source of truth by definition, because everybody's copying multiple version of the same information. The other thing is process dependencies. Now I'm doing the silly case of the apples, but this thing can get in the real world overcomplicated. I cannot sell the apple unless it is stamped with no OGM. I cannot sell it unless it has been shown that it has always transported at the temperature of, I don't know, five degrees Celsius. How do I track all this thing in an immutable and unconfutable way? It's a problem if you think about that. A lot of paperwork. And then, of course, we need a set of shared rules. What's shared rules? Silly things like in the Apple case. When do we define that I bought an Apple from somebody? If we can sit together and agree on all the rules that needs to be honored for buying an Apple, we have a set of shared rules. Hence, I can write a smart contract for them and automate the process. Make sense? So, at this point, we are ready for a game. What do you think about food provenance? Is that good for blockchain use case? What do I mean with food provenance? Things like, I really need to know how my Apple where it is harvested, where it is stored, uh, which certification it got, to which wholesaler it went to, and to which supermarket. Does it match all the things that we described before? Yeah. It's a good blockchain use case. Actually, it's one of the successful ones I, I, I'm, I'm going to show you. Uh, holiday tracking tool. I went to this place today, to the other tomorrow. I took my children, and I visited this other place. What do you think about that? Do I have a business network? It's a stretch goal, right? Uh, do I have multiple writers? Do I really need an irrefutable proof of transaction here? Maybe. I won't do that. Let One more time. Let me do this. Let's get this one. This is another one that usually generates panic. What do I mean with secure document store? Things like, uh, can I put uh, in a blockchain all the documents that typically in my company I put in my safe box? What do you think? It is private. Do I have a business network? I won't do that. I mean, there will be some documents that are only consumed by a single party. The other thing is that in blockchain, we really want to keep track of the transactions. We don't store documents inside the blockchain. That is not what it has been used for. I don't trust the employee, but then we, how many documents we share in common? So 
so I want kind of trying to uh, use blockchain to do a kind of audit trail. Let's do the, an audit trail then. You don't need blockchain for that. It's subtle, but you know, in some cases, like if you start storing all this document in the blockchain, it has not been designed by that. Actually, surprise, surprise, the dream of blockchain was to completely simplify the banking transactions. That's the only scenario that didn't manage to have it working currently. We will see one special case. The daily transaction, they don't work because right now it's not able to scale at that speed. So ide ideally, it was working wonderfully. I would say it has been designed for that, but that's the only scenario that is actually not in production. Um, let me go, let me skip that and let's jump into some real application because I think we have 10 minutes. Um, I really would like to be able to talk ab about, I mean, you know, at least high level about this three and then you will find me at the IBM boot if you have quest additional questions. So the typical scenario for which blockchain has been proved, it, it works nicely for enterprises, is supply chain. Uh, shipment to land, sea, uh, round, uh, invoice in this resolution, food provenance, or things like global financial transaction. That was a surprise to me. I was not that clever. I really didn't completely was ignoring the matter. Uh, supply chain actually was the first thing that we tried something like three or four years ago when we started investing in blockchain. So a typical scenario in IBM was we used to build a lot of hardware. We don't build all pieces of hardware by ourselves, but we get some pieces from providers. It's a common scenario. You will do it the same with cars, right? No magic. And so the typical scenario was somebody delivered a part, and then it will claim for money, and on the other side we would say, oh, no, you didn't deliver the, 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 the part. Why do you want to get money? And this was the typical dispute resolution issue that will take months and a lot of money spent in lawyers trying to understand, did you really deliver the part? Was the part delivered and stolen? Was the part delivered and never put into the warehouse? Or the part has been delivered, hence you need to be paid? I mean, this thing was taking forever. And this was the first pilot scenario in which we were trying blockchain. Because what's go what was going to happen? The part is delivered, everybody agree in this, in th in this Contest that will be, you know, the provider of the party and IBM saying, okay, the, the thing is there, transaction inside uh, blockchain, no more dispute. If it has been delivered and, and it's marked in blockchain, you need to pay. If it's not in the blockchain, it has not been delivered, no money. Easy like that. It takes seconds instead of months. A lot of work and pain saved. So let's look at the supply chain case. Key things you need to care about when building a blockchain for supply chain, but in general, you will see it works for a lot of the other cases. Uh, definitely, you need a member management. So I need a business network. So in the business network, I need to have, if we think about the Apple case, the guy who grows the Apple, the guy who harvests the Apple, the, w the, 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 the guys who are going to put it in the warehouse, the, the wholesaler, the retailer, the various supermarket, and so on. So I need a way to onboard this guy into the blockchain. Most likely, the users behind these guys will have to log in into the blockchain, most likely using a federated identity, because I don't want to learn another user ID and password, also to track my food. <coughs> there we are. And then definitely, we need to trace the assets, that's the key think why we invested in blockchain. So we need to know everything that happened into the life cycle of the Apple in the specific case. Uh, we need to be able to provide evidence, so the possibility to read all the blocks, all the transactions in the blockchain, as well as document sharing. It comes into the game, but it's not really an inherent building block of the blockchain. It, it's a side aspect. We typically do this thing using a cloud object storage. So you need a place where you put the documents that are certifying, for example, that the Apple contains no OGM. And that document needs to be audited. I need to know who access it, who modifies it, who, who deletes it. It has to be versioned. And I need to have a way to immutably store 
the version of that document into my transaction. Because if I said the Apple has been certified no OGM with version 1.1 on the document, and then somebody goes there and edits it, and there is a version 1.2, the next transaction should not be completed successfully. Do you get it? And then, of course, you need the poor nerd guys like me, they are going to operate the network and writing the code when you change the representation of the asset or you change the rule on the blockchain. Um, how do we change the rule on the blockchain? So I wake up one morning and say, let's remove the quality check on the Apple on the smart contract. Can I do that? It would be really impolite. <coughs> Besides that, <laughs> the thing is that all the stuff we work with all the members that have to vote in some way, and hopefully in automatic and software-based ways, on I agree on the change. Because if I allow a single member of the blockchain, later on, otherwise we don't finish. <laughs> Thanks. Keep a note. Otherwise, the whole consensus mechanism is broken. So everything is done by all the members in a consensus strategy, even if I have to do a silly software update because I can break the logic. Um, so this is actually a real thing that is in production. It's called TradeLens, and it's a, a, a work that has been done between IBM and Marsk. Marsk is the biggest shipping container company in the world. So the issue is, and I'm skipping this slide because I think this one is more impressive. These are all the steps that a container needs to go through from when it's uploaded to when it's offloaded. I'm not reading to all of them, but you can see there are dozens of steps and statuses that change for the container, whether they are getting transported over ground, whether they are checking the documents at the custom, whether they get to a port authority, where they get on a ship, where they get out of the ship. It's super complex, and the challenge here is that all the stuff was done paper-based. Absolutely no digitalization. That's the first step that has to be done. Then all the members, because it's not just IBM and Marsk, because if I don't have port authority, if I don't have customs, if I don't have the guys who's filling up the container on board, that thing doesn't work. So all these guys had to sit together, come with a representation of the asset, and come with a set of rules and documents that formally describe all the steps. Uh, and actually, this isn't working so nicely that currently even the competitor of Marx are coming on board. And this gives me the occasion to talk about the other solution because I have uh, five minutes left. Uh, so one of the typical scenario was the container arrives at a harbor and then the shipping documents were not correct. The container will stay in the harbor for two weeks. The container may have been contained perishable material like food. So after two weeks, you get the right document, you open the container and throw everything away. And with this solution, you can optimize it because you can send the shipping document even before the ship leaves the, the first harbor. And then that thing is tracked in the blockchain. We have the famous ha hashing mechanism that is stored together with the transaction when the port authority on the other side says, this is the right documentation, and it's saving in a transaction the hash of the document when the ship arrives, if somebody else changes the, the, the information in the document, the container cannot be offloaded because the port authority would say, hey, this transaction cannot be validated. But if everything goes well, the transaction is immediately validated and you immediately offload your container. And that saves a lot of money and food waste. And that takes me to this other scenario that is still in the food provenance world. And this all happened. One of the scenarios here is that besides we waste a lot of food because the container gets stuck into the arbor, the other thing is that food can be, be mislabeled or food is just bad at its source. It got contaminated. That's why the solution is actually called food trust. And I'm not going to explain why it's a good blockchain scenario because it's the bigger vision of the Apple case. But everything started with a real case from Walmart. Walmart is the biggest retailer on earth, I think, or at least in the US. So they got a problem. 
uh, their salad got infected by a bacteria that is called Escherichia coli. They have to recall a bunch of salad packages. They didn't know which ones. They didn't know to which supermarket they, they have been delivered. It took days. You can imagine the reputation of Walmart was damaged. People got sick. And so they said, no more. This thing has not to happen anymore. So they decided to start tracking food in a blockchain. And the pilot was quite interesting. So their main scenario was really being able to immediately uh, take back food, damaged food from the retailers. So the test they've done was with boxes of mango slices. So they wanted to know exactly from which farm a box of mango slices was produced. And with the traditional method, it took something like six days, 18 hours, 26 minutes to know exactly who did produce that mango. And in the meanwhile, for six days, 18 hours and 26 minutes, people maybe get sick or you have to withdraw all the possible mango slices boxes from the retailer, right? This was their issue. So they onboarded all this thing in the blockchain. And here, there are all the steps in the mango slice production. And you will know exactly who which retailer has that box of mango in, and who has produced it in 2.2 seconds. So imagine the immediate reaction you can have in a similar case. Uh, this is the thing I, I really I loved most. Imagine in Italy where we are really food crazy and knowing exactly, and actually in Italy you can do, in some supermarket you can do chicken tracing, <laughs> like you can know exactly where the chicken you're buying is being produced. And imagine you will know exactly all the certification possible that the the chicken, or in this case, in this case, the mango head from which farm it was taken, and all these nice things. Another thing that I may not have been enlightened enough: all this scenario works wonderfully hand in hand with IoT scenarios. A lot of the stuff without IoT sensors helping you automate all the stuff will be super hard to achieve and error prone. That is one of the things we want to discard. Um, 30 seconds, I will have the chance to talk about this one. This was really the one I was really ignorant about. So in my ingenuity, I thought that if you transfer money from one country to another, it happens like that. And to my surprise, that's absolutely not true. So the thing is, if you are crossing the borders, if the bank already know one each other, they did business, it's relatively easy. But then, depending on the amount of money you are moving, other banks will come into the game, they need to help the transaction. The various government and the various possible laws about taxes and anti-money laundry and all this nice security check that we have will get in place. And the consequence is that, surprise, you can get even up to several days to ship money from one country to another. So what they've done? Let's do it in blockchain. So if we can agree on a representation of money, because also the currency is changing from one country to another and it's fluctuating, so you can agree on a virtual representation of the currency and on a change, and then put all the information in a blockchain, you gain transparency, like you can still have all the intermediaries you used to have before, but you know exactly who's doing what and when in an automatic way. And if you're transferring money to China, for example, you don't care if the bank is closed because everything is done automatically. And you end up being able to do tr money transfer really re almost real time. That's it. I'm out of time. If you have questions, you'll find me at the, at the IBM booth downstairs or there are questions. Anyway, OK, works. I think we can answer uh, at least two questions. Actually, we have five of them in Slido. Oh. So uh, let's answer the most voted one first. Um, what do you mean by, wh what do you mean with Hyperledger provides identity in transactions as opposed to Bitcoin anonymity? If I send some Bitcoin, I know who I'm sending it to. <laughs> okay, good question. Uh, so the, the, the difference is that uh, when you're, uh, you have your nice Bitcoin wallet, the only way you can access your Bitcoin wallet is you need to have your private key, right? You lose the private key, nobody knows what's happening. There are people losing money with that because the, the lost the hard disk was formatted and completely there is no possible way to recover. So that's one of the Bitcoin scenario. 
On the uh, Hyperledger fabric side, I always know exactly who owns what. Owns, it's a big word, because we're not talking about money. But there is no this concept of, I mean, potentially, in the Bitcoin case, if I found his private key, I can get his money. In the Hyperledger fabric case, all the asset, actually all the transaction, because that's the thing I care about, they have exactly the information of who has done what. That's the key difference. And typically it's more than one person, because as soon as we get off the, um, we get into a single person state, the whole consensus stuff that is behind the story is lost. Okay, thank you. The next question is, how does the approval process work? How can I prove that a transaction was approved by my client? Uh, let me do a silly example. Actually, it's, there is a nice prototype that you, will, you, you can see for um, shipping medicines in, in Africa. So it's, it's an extreme case, but you can see an idea of how the approval works. So the problem that they have is that they lose track of medicines and they start selling fake medicines or they steal them. So what they do, example of a transaction. I go to a, a pharmacy sh shop, I get a bunch of medicine, I have to deliver it to somebody else. Their IoT comes into game, fingerprint scan from myself, fingerprint scan of the seller, they get sent into the blockchain, I mean, you get identified, the information is in the blockchain, information about the barcode of the medicine gets sent into the blockchain, information about the payment or whatever it is that you are going to do for the medicine, it's sent in the blockchain. When all these four things are in the blockchain, the transaction can get closed. Did I answer? No, I maybe think panic. So. Panic. <laughs> oh, GDPR, it's cool. Yeah. That's a tricky question. <laughs> Actually, that, that comes with two things. One, nobody ever asked, why this stupid lady is talking about blockchain in a cloud conference? You didn't think about that, right? Uh, the thing is that, by its nature, blockchain needs to live in an environment that is somewhat shared. I can even install in my house, that's okay, but then I need to give access to everybody and pretty much every member will want to have appear in the blockchain. So one of the nodes that is contributing to the consensus algorithm. And that comes with a problem. Okay, but if I'm Mars, can I have a node? And you have another node, and he has another node, and we won't have to be GDPR compliant. And I'm in Italy, I'm kind of safe, but maybe he's in the US or he's, I don't know, in South Africa. How do we do that? All the solution I've shown, they absolutely store no PII data inside the blockchain. Because you want to keep it in the cloud, also because you want to leverage the elasticity of the cloud to add more nodes and you know, scale ad infinitum or as much as your credit cards allow you to do that. And then all the things that contain PII data, typically they put them in a DB or typically in an object storage in the specific region where it can reside. So for IBM Cloud will be Frankfurt but absolutely no PII in blockchain, otherwise you get crazy. Or you have to install it in your own data center, not in the cloud. Okay, big thanks to Rosella.